Yeah, I actually, whoa, thank you. That was a, that's a, I do have this mic here that we are going to use it for. So we'll probably just pass the mic kind of thing uh, for questions. Um, I trying to think we have one, two, three. I'm, I'm not dressed as a mic tester. Okay. Wait, what were you going to say? Yeah, my, oh, yeah, Marshall's like official moderator of the house. MC, because his initials are MC, so right, that's uh... You know what kept me up last night? I had coffee for the first time in so long. And so all these random weird things were running through my head. And Michael Mosley, his initials MM. And I was thinking, man, his initials sound like mm. And every time he gives me it, like a word, it's just so in season, and I was like, mm. Mm. I love how your brain works. Not after coffee. My goodness. We forgive you in advance. You are free. So free. Yeah. Um, okay, let's see where we're at here in time. Okay, so we're good. We've got... Yeah, or you can... Or participate, too. Yeah. Um, so we'll start with this general question. Any uh, any questions that you flag in the teaching? Any any need for clarification on a certain subject? So this is like the free for all time. If there's anything. Good question. Um, it's funny, I actually taught a sermon on the spirit of Sabbath last year. Uh, be given, I'll, I'll send it to you. It's pretty, it's pretty detailed. It was way too detailed for a sermon. But uh, it's a great question. So I'll repeat the question because I have a mic on her. But the question is, does, do I believe that the Sabbath is supposed to be a certain day? Um, <clears throat> I believe there's a lot of wisdom in having a Sabbath on uh, like a day of the week. Like that is, the, that's actually, I think personally, I think that's one of the greatest faults, sources of issues in our nation right now. Um, number one, it's, it's actually what affects everything from health to uh, nutrition to spending, I mean, everything. It's like the Sabbath, I actually see the Sabbath as like the, uh, and we're gonna get into this next session on specifically the Sabbath in a lot of detail. But the Sabbath is like the central hub of the wheel. And the individual feasts are like the spokes in the wheel, but the Sabbath is the hub. Without Sabbath, everything falls apart. And so Sabbath is super important. Do I believe it's like a day, like a Saturday, Sunday? I believe that is very much up to uh, the Lord's leadership person by person. There's some people who have jobs, they just can't. And some people who can't even get a day off, but I believe in that season, the Lord provides grace to you to work from a place of Sabbath posture. So really the spirit of Sabbath has, is not about getting a day, but the day facilitates uh, posturing the heart, which is what it's all about. If you have the day off, but you never posture your heart, you missed it, right? But you also can learn to posture your heart and yet not have a day, but there isn't, that's not always the Lord's way. Like if you can take a day, take the day, because it usually indicates something about your heart when you're not willing to take a day when God's giving you grace to take a day, <laughs> right? Does that, does that make sense? Does that, does that answer your question, or do you have? Well, according to the word, according, yeah. I was just wondering, like, according to the word of God, like mm -hmm. God says, you know, six days you will labor, and mm -hmm. then you will rest on the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know, um, as far as the... Um, you know, the calendars, like right now our calendar, the first day is Sunday, the sixth day, the seventh day is Saturday. Mm -hmm. So like looking at it from that perspective. Right. Um, I, don't, I don't believe that the Lord's heart, even like in what he means behind the six days and the seventh day means that it has to be like Saturday 
or it has to be Sunday. I believe that's what Paul says where he's, he rebukes, I think it's in Colossians, where he says it's not about, you know, Sabbath and festival. Like he's drawing attention to the form. So the form is that it has to be Saturday or it has to be Sunday or it has to be this long. That's the form. Um, and we see in the New Testament, Jesus uh, kind of break the form with Sabbath. And that threw all the religious leaders off because he was throwing off the form. But he was trying to draw attention to what the Sabbath was really about. Uh, does that mean that like God won't want a day specifically? Like I think it is his heart for us as a culture to have a day off, you know? And I think we're gonna see a lot of good fruit in our land when businesses shut down on a certain day. But there are certain businesses that can't shut down on that day. Does that mean they should be excommunicated from the culture? No. So that's where we have to be sensitive uh, to the Lord's heart in that. But I don't believe when he like says six days in the seventh day, what we, how we interpret what day means is not in like a earth time way. Like he means something much deeper. There's a much deeper reality behind day. And that would, there would need to be like further discussion on that outside of this tonight, but. Does that help? Thank you. Uh Any other general questions? That was a great question, by the way. Sabbath is so important. Any other questions? And I know what it's like. Sometimes when you're searching for a question, you can't find it. But then once we move on, you get it. So, yeah. So let's go on to the next question. And if you get something else, just raise your hand and we can go back. That's okay. Um, so the, here's my general question. Uh, what do you believe? I want to hear some thoughts if you want to share. What do you believe is the purpose of education? Like when you think of education, what comes to mind? Or what do you, what do you believe is the purpose of education? I think education um, should be learning from history, wisdom from history, wisdom from mistakes and, and good, good choices made. And, um, and also the whole focus of education, I think, is to prioritize the Lord and glorify him and live by his word and to be educated to have the priorities straight, which is to honor the Lord and keep his commandments, honor, honor what he said to do. Mm. Yeah, that's excellent. That's actually in that answer, you hit on two of the seven components that we will be uh, discussing in more detail next week. But uh, one of them, when you said just keeping his commandments, making priority, that really is the heart of the Sabbath, right? So it's coming back to he's everything and we're responding to him. And we're not trying to get him to revolve around us. We're revolving around him. That's the heart of Sabbath. And number two is the history aspect. And uh, that's the past, present, future histories included in the past. Um, of that being one of the reasons that the Lord put the feast in the place was to pass on his history to the next generation. Um, and so that you hit on two of them. So great. That's awesome. Anyone else? I think the purpose of education is to know God yeah. and to hear him and to equip others to do the same. Yeah, that's awesome. That's, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's brilliant to know God. Yeah, um, what, go ahead, Sharon, you have? Well, yeah, not about him, but to know him. Exactly, to know him. Yeah, and I, you know, I, I don't want to share, get it too ahead because we will be talking about this, but why not, right? We can hit, we can hit something twice, especially when it's really important. But um, this is pretty amazing when you think that all education is really the testimony of the Lord at the end of the day. And not just the Bible. Like many times we think education, we think just the Bible, like, oh, okay, spiritual education, it's just teaching the next generation the Bible. But art, math, science, history, PE, uh, all the trades, whether it be engineering, law, like all these things, um, 
when the Lord shakes everything that can be shaken and all that's remaining, there's still gonna be needs for these things. Like you look at the description of the temple and they, if you calculate, like Dari had pointed this out, if you calculate the, the size and the dimensions of the beams and the strength of everything, the Lord, like, he didn't give them the formulas, but like there's scientific laws that govern the reason why the temple should be this thick and the beam should be this big. And so at the end of the day, everything, math, science, history is just the testimony of the Lord. It's what he says about physical laws that he created. History is, even history is a really important one, right? That's what's the rage right now. It's like, uh, what does God say about you know, the Civil War. What does he say about World War II? What does he say about these things? Not what man says, but what does God say? So you start seeing how in a spiritual city, there's this element the pray, where church and state become one, where prayer is brought back into the public schools or just schooling in general, where everything is prayerful. We're sensitive to the testimony of the Holy Spirit, where the teacher is sensitive to the testimony of the Holy Spirit. God, what do you say about this subject? And if they're checked in that moment and they're like, oh, you know what? No, I'm hearing the Lord say this about this subject. That's where like this brand new thing that we haven't really seen done before. I've seen, I've watched some like revival videos where, yeah, the little kids in the math class are worshiping, praising the Lord and the Lord's presence is touching them in math class. But other than that, we haven't seen what education really looks like in a revival culture. Um, so anyways, I forgot Sharon. Someone had brought the point up, but yeah. Uh -huh. So the way, the question was, uh, what do you believe is the purpose of education? Mm -hmm. And my thought was that it's to open a door to a different uh, practical reality. Mm. Or open the door to a practical reality. Yeah. I don't know what you would think about that, but like to give one example, like the whole purpose of learning math would be to build something or to write music or those sorts of things. Right. And the whole purpose of learning about God is to know him and experience him in a different way and then to walk out his nature in your own life. So like understanding opens a door to something and that's. Yeah, that's really good. Thanks, Marshall. Um, let's go to the next question. What are some, just for you guys personally, what are some positive and negative experiences that you've had with education? <laughs> and you're like, I don't. <laughs> yeah, we've read your book. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I think what led me there, the, the negative experience, was both in the public school system and in like children's church stuff. Mm -hmm. is just the teachers were so shallow with us that it was just boring. Mm -hmm. And the good experience would be the few teachers that would actually get into the reason why and have patience for all the little kids like, you know, yeah, but why, but why? And actually have really good answers for why mm -hmm. instead of just because or make up something. Because, you know, when you're little and you ask a question that's like genuine from your heart and you really want to know, um, being treated as if that question's a joke or if the adult doesn't have the capacity to answer, like I would have more, res I would have had more respect for them saying like, I don't know, but let's find out. Mm -hmm. And now we have no, like now that we have Google, it's like, <laughs> how dare you <laughs> just make something up or just turn it into some sort of a joke. And uh, so it just kind of shut me down and made me bored. Um, but there were those few teachers and the positive ones mm. experience was the teachers that would get into the why realm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to give more. If anyone has a, does anyone have a comment on that? Uh, just the why, the curiosity element of education. I'm going to try not to ramble, but um, so... I think to your point, David, like, you know, it talks about it's the, the glory of God to conceal a matter and it's the glory of kings to search it out, like at the heart of education, as opposed to what we have had since institutional schooling began, which is dumbed down schooling. It's not education for the most part, because education really draws out what is in the child. Like it teach, it takes, 
it assumes that they are um, capable, that they are made in the image of God, and so they're capable of discovery, and they're capable of mastery. And that, and it's about taking them on this journey of actually seeking out, and not just pouring things into them. And so that, that craving of like, well, tell me the why, like really comes from the heart of God, mm -hmm. from the image that they bear, right? They're searching it out. And so I think the, uh, the real downside of education, the way that it's generally fulfilled, and I've seen it in lots of different forms, is that it's dumbed down, like John Taylor Gunter would say, it's dumbed down, it's just, dead knowledge being passed on, I'm gonna beat you to death with a test, <laughs> mm -hmm. and not really allow, facilitate an environment of discovery, and curiosity. And I'm, I'm in a sweet environment now at a co-op, at a homeschool co-op, where that's exactly what's being facilitated, is just a spirit of discovery, mm -hmm. and a lot of hands-on learning and question, and real discipling that happens in and out of the classroom, and prayer happens, and so it's not disconnect to the best that, I've, it's the best combination I've seen of, um, of a spiritual environment for education. It's not perfect, but it's the best I've seen. It's a sweet environment, yeah. That's really good. Audrey. So my education has been a lot of remedial classes because I was diagnosed with dyslexic at a very young age. And so an unfortunate thing that happened with me is I was taken out of normal classes and put in these remedial classes. So I missed out on all the other stuff I needed to learn. Mm -hmm. And so from that space though, I was just overwhelmed as a child constantly. And I was in a whole bunch of extra tutoring classes and all sorts of things. But I think the biggest thing is when I was in sixth grade, I had one reading teacher who wanted to see me any extra time that I possibly could. And she actually instilled in me a desire to learn and a desire to discover and that curiosity and those things that actually like opened up like how to read mm -hmm. from a whole other perspective. So I think it's really like truly a teacher that's willing, mm -hmm. like a willing heart. Yeah. yeah. That's really good. Yeah, I'll just comment on that before uh, we remember go, but I completely agree. In fact, the one of the things that stood out to me, and um, I'll cover this in greater detail later, but the aspect of the feast is that the Lord doesn't tell them, doesn't tell the parents to teach their children proactively. He tells them to teach them when they ask the question why in response to their why. That's the way that he, he sets up the passing of the information. It's actually in response to their curiosity. Um, my, you know, from my experience growing up homeschool, like I was blessed, really blessed, uh, to cultivate a desire for ma the material itself because I had to complete my stuff by the end of the day, but my mom always would say like, if you really love what you're reading here, you can go back to it and read it. Like no one has a bell to you, you know? You just have to make sure that these other things get done. So, I mean, that's how I fell in love with classical guitars. Like I literally played for hours, you know? Or I fell in love with math and science. And it was just because there was this appreciation where we'd go and do it and then we'd go on a field trip. My mom would go, let's look at the history. And we'd get really into something. So there's just this cultivation of the material um, and a rest. And there wasn't that like, to the next thing, to the next thing, to the next thing, to the next thing, like cattle going through, you know, uh, what as much of our education, public education is like right now. So thanks, Doreen Robert, bless you guys. Hopefully we'll see you next time. So, yeah. um, so that, that, you know, that aspect of uh, learning from the why, and then also um, back again, the importance of Sabbath, where we learn from a place of rest, because even David, right, said, oh, oh, I love your law. And why did he love your law? Because the Lord himself taught him it. And we know the Lord's a really good teacher. And so um, Elijah actually told me this, Zerian told me this about, uh, I think it was, gosh, what's his name? The prophetic guy up in Carolina, um, Rick Joyner. It was Rick Joyner. Um, and he said that Rick Joyner has a school up there and the Lord had told him, he was praying over the school, and the Lord had told him to basically no homework assignments 
at home, like all work had to be done at school and they li- and to take one day off out of the school week. And he was like, uh, God, they have to pass the test. And he's like, trust me. And he's like, all right. Well, the kids like excelled like crazy, like and they did super well um, just because they were way overworked before and they couldn't learn, they couldn't get a, a desire for the material. They couldn't cultivate a affection for the material because of how fast paced everything was. And so I, that's like a huge thing. It's, it's the crux of everything of education is to fall in love with the material that you're learning um, and providing an environment for that to happen. And so even in the kids' ministry, the way that we've done that from the very beginning, the Lord, um, and Cynthia can testify because she's been in the kids' ministry, but we've always centered the material around lots of questions and almost have taught with questions <laughs> like, what do you think about this? The kids ask questions. Well, what about that? And like very sensitive to in the moment questions. Um, and honestly, there was, I think there was one lesson one time. I never even taught anything. All I did was get, ask questions. And they, the Holy Spirit actually taught the kids themselves through their own questions. <laughs> it was kind of cool. Um, okay. Um, let's see here. Do you believe there should be a separation between uh, what has been commonly called spiritual education from what has been commonly called public education? I know, I just wanna make sure. I just wanna make sure. If there's any thoughts on that. So I think, I just wanna make sure that we're all on the same page that education in a city built by the Lord, there is no separation. Uh, math, science, history, guitar, whatever it is, it is all, uh, as Marshall says, an open door to practical reality um, that is connected in the, to the Lord, like connected to the Lord's presence. Um, and so it's, it's important. And so just anyone here who's in a teaching capacity or just a mom capacity, like that's something I think moms struggle with is just like, you know, I know from my own wife, like it'd be discouraged of like, oh, I'm not in the prayer room, I'm not doing these things. I'm just changing diapers. I'm just like doing puzzles with James. And it's like, no, you're being just as spiritual as I am, like just as spiritual, especially when you're doing it, conscience of the Lord's presence is with you um, and sensitive to what he wants to say through you and do through you. Like it's just as spiritual. Um, what, uh, what is your definite Spiritual, up to, we'll say up to this tonight, what has been your understanding of um, spiritual? And was there anything in my discussion on what is spiritual that challenged your understanding? I just love that the Lord taught you about these truths about about his feast, about his appointed times, without you even looking for them, um, he just showed you one step at a time, mm-hmm. and uh, I just think that's so beautiful and amazing. Yeah, he's a good teacher. Yeah. You know, as you were sharing, and it, the way that we have been taught is so Greco-Roman. And as I started learning just the way that the Hebrews learn, it's all about life is spiritual to them. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think we just had gotten so away from that and not understood everything about life is spiritual Mm -hmm. because we're spiritual beings. Mm Makes life way more exciting too. Yeah. When your spiritual time isn't just in a building. Absolutely. <laughs> You're just felt and, and just, you know, okay, Jesus, what's next? You know, it's that anticipation of what he wants to teach us. I think I actually have to thank Marshall for that. I think no one has blown open my door of like living a spiritual life as he has just through his Ask Jesus and his <laughs> going on grocery trips with Jesus. <laughs> Like, it's been, yeah. I would say that, like, nature and adventure, I think, is something in the education and, like, spiritual space that, like, is really pivotal for connecting with God. Um, And even, like, just as kids, like, 
there's really no structure. They're literally just allowed to like play in nature and that really be like a moment where they're connecting with God. Um, Because, I mean, that's how I met God was in nature. (laughs) Mm -hmm. That's good. I just want to put an exclamation point on that. I think that's something that we've lost in our productive and then like screen-based societies is not just the enjoyment of nature, but the law of nature. Mm -hmm. And something really important that the Declaration of Independence appealed to, even before it appealed to the law of God, was the law of nature. Mm -hmm. And then of nature is God. And so being able to enjoy nature to the point where it's like, in Romans when the Lord says that everything in creation, or Paul says it, but you know, Lord through Paul, everything in creation, speaks of who God is. And so we're all without excuse. But if we're so distracted to learn from nature, like we're not gonna have these things written on our hearts. So anyway, mm. glad you brought that up. Yeah, that's a really good point. Glad this is being recorded because I'm definitely gonna, I, it's something that did not stand out to me before. Thank you for that. Any other thoughts before next? Um. So this, I'm excited to hear on this one. What does a spiritual city look like to you? What does the city built by God look like to you specifically? What is the vision or the blueprint that you have in your heart? About 1,500 miles wide. <laughs> Tom? A cube? I tremble to say it, but uh, maybe it's more lack of faith than actual faith. So I'm just like, man, like a government, an education city, or uh, in a business sector, like just all the, what's commonly called the seven mountains, like pursuing the knowledge of God and and unity with each other. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it can actually be done and we just need a generational vision. Mm -hmm. And it's been done before and it's, like we've got the video series of places where it's been done. Mm -hmm. And uh, so um, I think the Lord's put some fear and overwhelmedness in our hearts um, in regards to the country because it's so big or even in regards to our city because how many millions of people are here now? Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. I think I've lost track of that so it can be overwhelming. And so I just, sometimes my vision is too small and the Lord has to rebuke me and tell me my my vision's too small. Mm -hmm. And so I think, like, yeah, he should have this city. Mm. Yeah. The question is, what does a spiritual city look like to you? Do you believe San Antonio can be that spiritual city? I've been actually, the Lord, I was just telling Marshall, the last few days, actually, I've, you know, so this last year, like, the area of health, nutrition, and education has been, like, our education has been always there, really, you know, with the kids, but, like, this last year, nutrition and health has been a thing, and I'm just, like, wondering, like, as I'm following the Lord, I'm like, why do you bring these things up? Like, they just seem random, right? But then as you start to see how it's just healing what is spiritual and like, oh, a city in every area of the city and these things that we've deemed as secular, not secular, like they actually originated with God and like, what do they look like God's way? You know, we've only seen the perverted view of them, which is why we want to just see them completely done away with. And he's like, no, I actually want to recreate and like renew and refresh and and tear the things that don't belong, but the things that are for me, I want to remain. Um, But so like what's been in my heart lately is just the marketplace and like business and like, you know, uh, it's been on my heart just the last few days, like the transfer of wealth from all these prophetic scriptures about the wealth going from the kings of the nations to the house of prayer, basically, you know, and just hit my heart really strong yesterday, wealth transfer with the understanding that the purpose of the marketplace is to be the agents that transfer the wealth from the kings to the, the spiritual city. And 
<clears throat> and so anyways, there's so much to explore there. It just really excited me. But like, that's where he has me right now with that. <laughs> I'm gonna piggyback on the marketplace because I think something that has to do with that is also the spirit by which mm -hmm. you operate within that realm. And so what's common, you know, that I saw in working for Home Depot um, and even in the hospital, like just the retail mindset of repeat customers enslaved to your system. Mm -hmm. um, but then not just that you want them on your system, but you want to destroy the competition. Mm -hmm. And in Isaiah 2, where it talks about like, everyone's gonna to come to my mountain and learn my law and they'll never again learn war. Like, I think one of the ways that affects that place is um, something Allie's brought to her community within YouTube and the art and the things that she's done. Because when she first started breaking out at, as a YouTuber, and an artist, and there was always this gossip and infighting. Mm -hmm. So she started something maybe about six, seven years ago in the community that's really transformed the community. And she's like, guys, community over competition. Because mm -hmm. we're all different creators. Mm -hmm. We're all creating different things. Even if we all sell like one certain type of product, like my art's on my product, your art's on your product. And like, let's celebrate each other in that and lift each other up. And what she and the entire community has found, instead of people like warring for market share, the community is making the community stronger. And so it's growing, there's more life in it, and they're every, like everyone's growing in every sense. So like mm -hmm. laying down the competition to be in community um, has been a blessing. And it's not like people have to go without but the Lord will bless that, and everyone everyone has plenty. Mm -hmm. So that's that so just one example that we've walked through. But like that would touch every every sphere, and we're talking the education. So I just pray yeah. the Lord give us wisdom into like yeah. what are the different yeah, operating please. modes, and we'll, you'll probably get into that next week, so that we can begin to transform that and see blessing in every area. Yeah, that's so good. Yeah, there's so much in that, that Dave's point right there, that, that I think you just proposed that could be like a whole other course class right there because, that, <laughs> because like when you start understanding the Babylon, the city of Babylon that's going to be destroyed, like that is not like one, it's not like a specific city, like it's a system of thought. Um, it's a system of thought that is behind, that's why it says the merchants weep. You know, it's why in Isaiah 2, when he was quoting about the mountain of the Lord being established on top of the mountains, you go down in the judgments, and one of them is that the Lord's going to come upon everything proud and lofty, upon the ships of Tarshish, was one of the things mentioned. If you look into ships of Tarshish, they were the ones responsible to just basically being the system, the, the carriers of greed, really, is what they were. Um, but then there's also the verses that say the chips of Tarshish are gonna come and bring spoils into the God's house. <laughs> so there's redemption, right? So like we have, we have hope. Um, but man, just when you were saying that, like I'm just flooded with so many questions of like, God, like we've only known business from a spirit of greed for the most part in our nation. What does it look like to know business from, from the heart of the king? And we know business is his heart. I mean, look at the parables with the talents. Like, if you don't give yourself, at the end of the day, us investing myself, giving myself to Dave before he gives anything is an act of business. You know, I was talking to Jalen and I were on a date last night at the, our favorite our Vietnamese pho place. And I was just, I was, you know, we're eating and I was realizing like, they just made, we put, we came in, they seat us down, we made an order and they brought us food. We haven't paid them yet right? There is somewhat a fabric of morality in our society that I can place an order and they make me food without me paying. But imagine if that, our fabric of, that moral fabric began to deteriorate to the point that when I come into the restaurant, the, the owner is sizing me up and going, is this guy really going to pay? And he's like, mm, yeah, you need to put down 50% up front before you can, you know, place an order, and then maybe 50% after. You see how it starts changing the way that, but when there's, when the heart of the king is in every person, um, you start to understand why he says, you don't charge your brother usury, you know, or interest, like give to him and trust that out of, 
you know, uh, the heart of the Father working in them that he's going to take care of you. And I think that's where the thing we have to understand, marketplace under the king is that he's the pro- always the provider, but our burden is to give ourselves, give our value that we offer to the community. So we're going kind of off subject here, but it really excited me. <laughs> that was good. Throw them, Marshall. Throw your thoughts. That we have extremely interesting. So a lot of this stuff actually boils down to the way we view the gospel. So it's like it says that the kingdom of heaven is like a man that found a treasure hidden in a field and he sold everything that he had to buy that field. And so most people have preached the gospel, and especially. Uh, it's I'm not going to point fingers, but um, who. In the West, it's been especially preached as basically you sinned, you're a worthless piece of crap, and so God just mysteriously loves you enough to like give his son so that you could spend eternity with him even though he hates you because you could do nothing but sin. And this is a complete perversion of what was established because Jesus first, as the representative of the kingdom, he saw the treasure that was hidden in the field of iniquity and he sold everything he had in order to buy that field. So you're the treasure hidden in the field and then he, but he doesn't sow himself without expect, like nobody plants a seed without expecting to reap a harvest. And so he, he came and he gave of himself, but he wasn't expecting nothing from you. Like that's, that's the other part that we don't get wrong. Like what he wants is you, like he wants all of you. Like he wants to replicate himself in you. And so he came with an end in mind um, for the farther into the kingdom. And so as we get those things, if, as the understanding of our individual value, in the sense of like, he's not a chump, he didn't get hustled, he didn't pay a high price for nothing, then uh, you begin to apply that and it unfolds in a whole lot of different ways. And it becomes much more practical to the way we live than just this, hey, if you think you can do anything, it's because you're prideful. Mm. Yeah, that's really good. I actually, one of this guy, one of the guys who supports me and Jayla just on a monthly basis and stuff, he he was saying, I was telling him how like I intended to, to do some things and he, uh, I was getting into like more guitar and stuff and he said, he's like, you know, it's funny. He's like, one of the, he said, there's this guy that I heard one time told me that like when he gives to people, he doesn't give to them based upon what they're doing. He says he gives them because he believes in that person. So when he's investing in them, he's not investing in the work that they're doing. He's actually investing in that person and the gift that they are to society and the gift that they are to the kingdom. And I just like really was struck by that. I was like, that's, kind of in line what you were saying. Um, and so that, but that carries on with the value thing because we give first, mm-hmm. right? Like he loves, so like he, we love because he first loved us. But he's, he's, do, he's investing and planting with an end in mind, expecting to reap a harvest. And that's like the lament through the prophets of like, I plant a good seed. Why is it bearing bad fruit? Like I, I planted you in the ground. I gave you my law. I gave you my word. Now I'm getting degenerate vines. Like what happened? Mm-hmm. So he's like actually expecting like when he plants something, it's going to bear a certain type of fruit. Yeah. That's really good. Any, any follow-up thoughts or questions? <laughs> yeah, this, is, this is exciting stuff. Uh, yeah, spiritual city. This is all part of the spiritual city. And it's part of education because like... I didn't maybe make this clear in the beginning, but when we're talking about education, we're not just talking about public school education or, or, or just education in the church. We're talking about education that touches every level. So we're talking about a type, a seed and type and pattern, a model that affects how businesses can train their employees, how, um, how you as a mom can teach your kids at home, how a church can be, you know, so it's a, it's a model that applies to all levels of society. So that includes business and marketplace. Um, what, on the area of the feast, what has been, and I, just because of time, I'm probably gonna just skip to um, maybe question eight, but how have you up to this point interpreted the Lord's command for the feast to be fulfilled as perpetual statutes? Maybe you were not even familiar with that before, but um, how have you interpreted that up to this point? And was there anything that challenged you from tonight's teaching uh, regarding this subject? Well, for me, a little bit, I was challenged. 
I'm challenged a little bit by, um, because in, in the word of God, God says, okay, in the month of, you know, whatever, whatever the Hebrew calendar month was, mm -hmm. this is when I want you to celebrate it. This is what I want you to do it. And so I'm a little challenged with just doing away with, with um, you know, that particular, whatever, you know, our month is compared to the Hebrew month. I'm a little bit challenged right there. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm gonna write that down just as a, uh, as a point to come back on with maybe some more uh, uh, scriptural examples to just to show the shed light on that, okay? Let's see here. I actually met, I met a family that's a Messianic Jew family. I mean, they have like a very small congregation and um, close by. And I have had the desire to learn about feasts and the Hebrew calendar and everything forever. I have always wanted to learn and they invited me to join and um, it, has, it has been so beautiful. And I, and I don't see it as, as like religious or, um, it's so beautiful mm -hmm. to learn about the Lord's feasts, to learn about the meaning of the month, what the letters mean, every letter in the Bible, it's mm -hmm. amazing, it's all numbered. And I have never known this before. And I feel like I was lacking. I, I wanna know, I wanna celebrate. And God has moved in my life personally by partaking on that day on his, on his calendar and celebrating in the tradition, whatever that is, which I'm still learning and I don't know much, but I've only, done, I've only gone to two um, of the of the feasts or the I don't even know what to call it, but it 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 revolves around God's calendar, and I just think it is worth time just to learn. Mm -hmm. And but I love what you're saying about the grace and how Jesus came, and he wants us he wants it to be in spirit and in truth. Mm -hmm. That's the main thing that I'm taking away from what you said, mm -hmm. and I think that's. From what the one that I've joined, that my family has joined, they are so sincere. It is very, very graceful, and spirit and truth is a great way to put it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's really good. I have two take. Well, I know Sharon, you have probably one of two. I want to had something that came to mind for um, uh, Senator's comment, but then also to answer what you're saying, I want to be very clear. I'm not at all wanting to discourage anyone who wants to do what, like celebrate learning about, because there is in every detail, like as you go back and study the Old Testament and you study every detail about the month, God is communicating something in everything. And so, um, I mean, I'm totally for that. I had someone recently ask me this question of like, well, the confusion comes along the area of fulfillment, of what does it mean to fulfill something? Um, and that I think I've noticed is where the branch starts to kind of go two different ways because there's groups of people that will say that doing it on a specific month, doing it, replicating the forms is the fulfillment. And at the same time, they'll say, but it's grace, you're not, it's not religious. Um, I'm not saying that this is this person, I'm just different parties I've recognized say this. The problem with that is that if that is the fulfillment according to what the Lord said, fulfillment as perpetual statute, that's a command of the Lord. Therefore, if we don't do it, it is sin and we are to hold account to it. So that's where the, the confusion can come in and goes, it's really important that we understand what does it mean to fulfill? It doesn't mean that you can't practice it. It just means that once you use the word fulfill, you set a standard for the community that just like fulfilling God's heart for not committing adultery or something like that. Like it's, it's on that to me, any, every command of the Lord we're supposed to fulfill. Um, now, on the issue of like, well, God said like on this month, why, how can we have the liberty to not do that? Um, it's for the same reason, and it's not actually an issue of grace, although many people will say that like, oh, it's grace. Um, 
it, ha- it comes down to what was God intending by wanting it on that month? Um, what was he going for for that specific type of people? A lot of the patterns of the feast, a lot of the things of even what they did didn't actually originate with the Hebrews. They actually, God was meeting the Hebrews based on what they were familiar with in Egypt. The, even the Ark of the Covenant didn't originate with God. It originated, other cultures, Egyptians, other cultures around the world have their own Ark of the Covenant that preceded the Hebrews. Um, but one of the, the examples that I always use or that I come back to as a very strong scriptural example um, that kind of invites us to think differently about these things is the uh, topic of circumcision. There's nothing more strong from the Lord to Abraham than the topic of circumcision was. He literally said, if you do not, any male who's not circumcised, they broke the covenant, they're cut off. Like they will perish, they're done. <laughs> they're outside the community. Um, and so you have this very strong, like you shall be circumcised. There's no commandment from Old Testament to New Testament where it says that's undone. And so you see why the Jews, even in the New Testament, had such a hard time understanding why the Gentiles who were uncircumcised could be part of their assembly. They had a really hard time because in in the Old Testament, it says that no no uncircumcised man was allowed to be part of the assembly. Um, And so you're like, well, wait a second, God, you said circumcised in the flesh, specifically in the flesh. And Abraham took his man and they circumcised 40 guys or something like that, like as old men. I'm like, but like went and did that in the flesh, right? And so you're asking like, wait, what, what, how can from before cross to after cross, there be this permission to not do this where Paul literally is uh, calling them Judaizers, the people who are coming into the Galatians and trying to convince them that in order to be right with God, they have to circumcise themselves in the flesh. Well, it makes sense if you believe that was God's commandment in the Old Testament, why they would do that. There's a revelation that they're missing. And that's where I pointed to the changing of the law is so important. The changing of the law uh, shows us that there was a changing of the priesthood. The changing law is the forms. It's saying that God was never really about the forms. He didn't care really of circumcised flesh, although there is some practical health benefits to that. But it's about the heart. He wants the circumcision of the heart. Um, And so once you identify the spirit of the substance, of God's commandment, the way that that commandment plays out in a specific community, specific person's life, may actually look, he actually may want them to do something that looks very much like the original form, or it may not. The issue is identifying the substance. Does that make sense? I know that was a mouthful, but yeah. Uh Uh-huh. So like one of the things Charles was talking about was the the nature of the feast being cyclical to communicate something, right? So if you look at every detail of the law, the whole purpose of what the Lord gave was to speak to them in a language of what they were experiencing in Egypt. Now, if you go into any culture uh, throughout the world, whether it's Greece, whether it's China, whether it's ancient Egypt, they have pagan festivals, right, that they observe at a specific time and a specific season. This goes back to your question about the Sabbath too. Because what the Lord was doing was he was taking these things where they saw, they, there was this understanding, no matter where you go, that creation is alive. Everybody perceived that. Um, in Greece, in ancient Israel, all these things, like there was this thing of like, there's something else there. Every culture tapped into that. And he's taking that and he's recentering it. And he's saying, it's not all these deities, what you're perceiving is my nature. And so he gave them a law and a system of feast that would communicate his truth and his law and his way of understanding to them um, coming out of their pagan ways, right? And so when you go back to the question about are we called, or do we have to observe the Sabbath on Saturday, which is the seventh day of the week, the answer to that is no. And if you go back to Genesis and you look at it, it's like the same thing, and we're called to complete the Sabbath, but that same way that he's communicating a progression of meaning within the feasts in a cyclical way to teach as objects to teach a heart. Um, And that's what uh, Charles will probably get to that more, I would guess, next week. He's doing the same thing in the order of creation. So on day one, there's the chaos, there's the darkness, and he says, let there be light, right? That's the same thing he did to you when you were saved. He came into your darkness and he said, let there be light. And Jesus came in and he was born again in your heart, right? And so that there you were fulfilling that day. 
And at the same thing, you were fulfilling the Feast of Hanukkah where the light came into the darkness. And so he's coming back and he's adding feasts that will point to his divine and eternal truth. And so when we're keeping the feast, we can keep it on a certain day, but he has those things in an order that relate to the building up of the person, the community, and the nation, right? And so all those details are important to study and it's fun to celebrate, but what the new covenant is about is it's taking those physical things that he gave that they couldn't enter into the spiritual reality because of their sin, and it's saying, okay, now we're going to the heavenly tabernacle, and if you having begun by the spiritual reality are now trying to go back to the fleshly thing, I hope you, if you teach physical circumcision, I hope you cut the whole thing off because it, it'd be better for you in the day of judgment, right? Because, Paul says that. Yeah. yeah, so Paul literally says that. Like, if you're trying to go back to fleshly ordinances after you started with Christ as your high priest— it's like he's, they actually go so far to say as those who minister at the physical altar, they have no right to eat at the altar that we've, we've gone to. And so this whole question about the observance of the law, all the Hebrew roots people will kind of parse in interesting ways where they'll say, yeah, yeah, we're called to keep this part, but not this part. And the fact is God never commanded that. So if you want to keep the feast, you need to go back to Israel. You need to go observe it in the temple or you're violating the law. And so if Jesus is a priest according to that ordinance, he actually didn't fulfill the law because he's not from the line of Aaron. So either Jesus didn't keep the law or there's something else that God is trying to get to. And this is at the foundation and it's something that's actually the Lord's bringing back to the forefront because all our systems of theology have kind of obscured this form of vision. And that's the whole purpose of education is to reveal those things so that you can enter into that reality. And every one of the feasts is an access point. And so, again, if you go back to Hebrews, he talking about the seventh day and the Sabbath observance. Um, I'm assuming it's Paul. We don't know who wrote Hebrews, but... Uh, <laughs> yeah, so Dave thinks there's a lady. Traditionally, it says Paul. I tend to incline towards the Paul interpretation, but there's merits to that too. But uh, he says if, um, talking about Joshua, so there's a number of levels on which Sabbath apply. Um, talking, to, talking about Joshua when they entered in to establish the Sabbath, to establish these things within the, with the promised land. He says there was a Sabbath which they did not enter into, which we enter into through Christ, which is the Sabbath of the heart, the soul, and the actual reconciliation to God of an entire society, instead of having this veil of the flesh, which is fleshly sacrifices, which is a physical temple, which is all these things, because we're his temple, we're his bride, right? So we can't be his temple and that other thing be his temple. The first temple that he gave where we, all these feasts centered around the first tabernacle, those were things that are a type pattern, right? Moses built it according to the pattern of what he saw in heaven, that it was just, it was something that we could enter in through. And so every one of those details needs to be studied and needs to be understood because Jesus is the bread of the presence. Jesus, his, his flesh was pierced. He was the veil that was torn for us to enter in, right? He's the holy of holies. Like as we die with him, we offer up incense to him continually and eternally. As you enter in through the outer courts and you wash yourself in the bronze laver, you see the reflection of your sin. You're washed by the water of his word and you're cleansed and you enter into the outer court, uh, into the holy place and into the most holy place. And we become the type pattern of the high priest. And so every one of those details in each one of the feasts, and not just the feast, but the circumcision, like all through the prophets, it talks about the circumcision, which is of the heart. Same thing with the Sabbaths. But even in the prophets, we already see this, this uh, tension, or not tension, just pointing, because the law very clearly dictates that eunuchs will not be part of the assembly. Isaiah, before Jesus came, is already pointing back to, like, hey, eunuchs are going to be accepted too. The barren will bear fruit. And instead of being cut off, it's like these eunuchs are going to be part. And so the prophets, all through the law and the prophets, before we even get to the New Testament, are already pointing to this. And they're criticizing them for continually thinking that it's about these fleshly external things. And they're not seeing the heart. And it's the same thing Jesus comes and rams home again. And so that's central to everything we're talking about. Yeah. Um, and so on just a really practical level, though, you might be like, well, okay. So like what Cynthia was pointing out, like there's this beautiful, there's this beautiful like, uh, knowledge and things to gain from doing things like even replicating on the calendar. And so I'm not against that at all. Like, uh, cause there is something to learn from that. It's the, the issue comes in, remember we're, why we talk about a spiritual city is everything's connected to the spirit of God, the living and active testimony of the Lord. So let's say we're coming up to 10 days, actually, ironically, we are lining up to 10 days of <laughs> coming around the 10 days, but Let's say that the Lord, the way that he's, the assumption that we make 
I'll start this. The assumption that we make is that if it is calendar dates, times, and seasons, let's say that is true, then that means that God is expecting all his people on this 10 days that's coming up, the Day of Atonement, to posture ourselves around, you know, repentance of sins. And I mean, it was such a serious thing that if you were not fasting and weep, like mourning and you did not fast, like I think the law actually said to kill that person. <laughs> like that, it was that serious. Um, but the assumption is that God is moving that way because it's um, been commanded on that lunar calendar cycle of that, at that time and season. And that biblically is just not, over the whole course and counsel of the scriptures is not true. So it's not an issue of like grace or we have like either permission or not. The issue is coming back to the heart of what God is actually after behind the command. And so as a community, like how do we know how the Lord is visiting us? How do we know what feast we're in? So the feasts illustrate the way that he relates to his people. How do we know how he's visiting Sad Hop right now? How do we know? And does that mean that the, the calendar month season that we're in, oh, that's the way that he's visiting us? No, he's not tied down to the earthly calendar. He's in heaven. He, you know, and so he gave the earthly calendar for us to, as a tutor to learn so that his people could be familiarized with the stuff, but that's not, uh, he's not revolving around earth, earth revolves around him. Um, and so that, does that make sense? So the only way we'll get to this next week, but is through active relation with the Holy Spirit. As we seek the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, like what are you, how are you visiting your people? And if, remember, if you were here when I taught on the Feast of Eleven Bread, practically that looks like, hey, we're gonna spend time of silence before the Lord, we're gonna wait on him. You know, it's a different heart posture than uh, blow your trumpets, he's coming. You know, like it's a way different, like uh, it's a way different way of relating. But right, we know even in a service, a Saturday service, that there's times when we're sensitive to the spirit of the Lord, like, oh, we need to be quiet right now. We need to tune in and be quiet. We need to be silent. And then there's times where we're like, we're jumping up, shouting and celebrating. Like even in a single service, the Lord's feasts are being fulfilled they could be set, all seven of them, all in one service, depending. It's, it illustrates the ways of his heart at the end of the day. Yeah, it probably would be up on those five hour services. But, um. And just like another couple verses to, if you wanted to meditate on this more, and Charles will, like he said, get to it next week also. But if you go to 1 Corinthians, I believe, chapter 5, and then the whole book of Hebrews. And then several other places, like if you just start to go listen through like how the apostles refer to keeping the feasts. So like in uh, first, I believe it's first Corinthians chapter five. I, I, I could be a little off. It's been a while. Okay. Yeah. So he tells them to keep the feast of uh, the Passover, Passover and leaven bread. at a time that that's not the correct date on the calendar. And he applies the heart of it and the teaching of it to a practical reality. So by removing the sinner from their midst, Right, so he says, like this guy that's sleeping with his mother-in-law, like get him out. <laughs> and he compares that to like that's how we keep the feast in this context. And so that's just one example. And then it, I mentioned the Passover from or the Sabbath from Hebrews, but the, it pops up like after Hebrews chapter six. It's like now we're departing from the principal teachings and we're entering into deeper things. And so there's a building, but it, that's there's a building on itself of from creation where he's bringing us back to Genesis. Um, just in our understanding. Do you guys have any follow up? I know that was a that's a that's a lot. You might be like, "Wow, that was like a really passionate reply to a simple question." <laughs> it's only passionate because for two reasons. One, it's it. I understand why at face value you're like, "Wait, what?" Like it says this. I get that, um, and so it's a very hard thing to explain because it's. Well, it's not so much hard to explain, but it, it's one of those things that is best found like giving a couple of scriptures and then when you with your own eyes go, oh, oh, it says this, but God, why are you doing this? And that tension when we talk about curiosity, that's the, that's the beauty of the scriptures or these paradoxes where you're like, God, you said this and it's so clear and plain, but you said here is something that's so clear and plain that contradicts this thing <laughs> or seems to contradict it and it's not. He's inviting in us to a deeper reality of his heart the danger and why they're like, even Marshall and I are like, have a, a strong reply on this is that uh, we, 
it really does a lot of damage to the body of Christ and it does a lot of damage to God's heart when there is a understanding that's placed and it becomes a ceiling to the exploration, which is really what goes against God's heart ultimately for education in the first place. Like he is inviting us into the deeper realms of his heart of understanding the mysteries of his word, understanding the mysteries of why he says things. And so as soon as something is said of like, no, this is the way that it's supposed to be, um, if anything, we're just removing the things that are saying this is the way it's supposed to be and going, we need to seek the Lord. Like, you know, it's not about actually setting, no, this is the way it is. It's that this is the way this is, is not. And we're moving the things that are not. We're deconstructing to give space for individuals and communities to, to seek the Lord on these things because it's gonna be different community by community. By community. Um, and there's nothing person, wrong with person. following the feasts. Like the early church did yeah. it. It's when you say this is righteousness and that all people are supposed to be more like the Jews. Like as soon as somebody says we're supposed to be more like the Jews or you need to be more culturally Jewish or you're too Greek or like all those sorts of things or like that's a Greek way of thinking, false every time because the Greeks had all the same presuppositions that everybody else did, and so did the Jews, and so did the Chinese. Like, they were all starting at the same basic place. There were certain philosophers that came along, but it's like if somebody comes to you and says, hey, God gave this revelation to the Jews, and this is how he wants you to do things, that's somebody that's Judaizing you, and they're after your salvation. They're, trying to, they're literally trying to make you more Jewish. Sharon, you were very patient back there. Sorry. <laughs> My simple perspective of this for years has been that our bridegroom was raised as a Hebrew. And as a bride, I always wanted to know and understand what he celebrated. And so for me, that's, that's really a lot of what the feasts are besides the fact that... Um, I think just like what you were talking about, Cynthia and Sandra, I think us coming from a different mindset than male, it's, it, it is, it's like, wow, just, you know, you just look at it and go, it's all planned out. Everything in it, it's like, you see the heart of God in those feasts and in the Sabbath. And then, well, you know, just as we explore his word, we see his heart, but, but just the way that he called them out and drew them this picture of who he wanted them to be and how much he loved them, you know, it really is a bridal thing for me. The other part of it is, for me, is, is um, how the church has gotten so off of that. I mean, the, you know, just, we have the other pagan, other pagan holidays that, are, that has come into the church and taken away from the truths of his feasts. And so I, I look at it as if we can just kind of get them off of that and get back into God's ways the way that he sees things or the way that he started it all. You know, I'm not saying we have to celebrate it. It's just, it's a different point of view. Does that make sense? I think so. I think I'm catching some of what you're saying. Yeah, that. you know, just because it's like you know, Christmas is not, it's not Jesus' birthday. It's not, but we can go back and now you can take a, a wonderful, um, what am I trying to think of? creation that NASA created, you know, and, and take and go back all the way when Jesus was actually born and see what all the stars were doing and all the planets were doing, and then actually come up with a date, mm -hmm. which was actually during the festival time when he was born. So, you know, you just look at it and just as he was the Passover lamb, those, just like you said, you know, some of them have already been fulfilled. He's continues to fulfill them. Go ahead. So the one thing that breaks down on the practicality of having to follow the feast was like, if somebody goes and cheats on their wife, should they wait for the Feast of Unleavened Bread to repent? Right. 
there's like, so there's like, that's what we mean, like the real practical level of there's like, these things unfold on a lot of different levels. And so on a community basis, it's great to have like things that we agree on so that we can meditate on the Lord together. But that's also part of what Charles is getting at of like, there's different levels of where like one person might be at a place where they really need to (laughs) search their heart. And I, I would say just on guard against um, I know like even like yes Jesus he was born as like he was born as a Jew and he I believe he's I mean I don't know for sure but like I, I believe that even us as people like with different nationalities and stuff like those are things that the Lord doesn't do away with like you know like even with resurrection, like he celebrates his all tri- tribes, nations, and tongues will be worshiping him. Um, but at the same time, the Paul, like the Bible warns against knowing Christ according to the flesh. He even says like, we don't know him, thus we know him no longer according to the flesh. And what he's drawing attention to is, um, and this might sound crazy, but like even... As humans, like throughout you see throughout the Jewish history, they would take something that God gave, like the bronze serpent, right? Like God gave that in that moment, that was an act of faith to look upon it for their healing. They then memorialize it and they turn it into an idol that God has to destroy. <laughs> um, and so in that moment, it was active because it's connected to the leadership of the Holy Spirit, right? What God was actively doing, but then they fix it in time. And they say, now this is basically our God. Every time we look at it, we're healed. And the Lord's like, I'm not moving that way anymore. That's become an idol. And we can do that with anything. We can do that with anything. We can actually do that with even uh, Jesus' um, physical form, where he actually, yes, he's a real person, but what makes him a person is much more than his, um, like the fact that he w- was born as a Jewish man. And so that's all I want to say on that is just like, to be on guard a little bit against some of that because I have, the Lord himself has actually pulled me back from even some of those, um, of things I've really glorified, like even his Jewishness because he he w- was made a Jew and we know that for sure. Um, but he wants us to know him as not limited to that, if that makes sense. I'm probably not, this is a little off top, you know, off of what I was prepared for, but um, so I'm not explaining it super well. But that that is exactly the kind of like what we're pointing to because if Jesus fulfilled the law according to the flesh as a Jew, then he is not our high priest because he simply wasn't from the line of Aaron. Like he can't be that and our high priest. See, so it's like that's the distinction to which the writer of Hebrews draws. It's like if it's according to this those people have no right to enter into the altar at which we now minister. Jesus being the high priest according to the order of Melchizedek, he fulfilled all those things in a way that entered into the heavenly tabernacle. And so if we stop at he did these things as a physical man, we don't get to enter into the heavenly reality of it. So like each one of those feasts is actually an eternal reality that points towards something higher. So it's like each one of those feasts points to a truth that applies every single day of the week. Right, And so that's the part where if we don't enter into that, then we've actually stumbled over the stumbling block of the flesh and we've stumbled over the cross the same way the Jews did. And so that's the part where like there's a, there's the innocence where like a lot of people, they begin to see the thing and it's like, well, Jesus did this, so now you have to. And it's like Jesus, you know, he kind of did, but like not the way that people think because he continually overturned like what their thought was of what it meant to fulfill the law. Jesus was the only one keeping it. All of them had it wrong. And he tells them, be let, beware, like he tells them several times, beware of the leaven of the scribes and the Pharisees. And then everybody gets a hold of that and they're like, oh, you need to go learn from the Jews how to keep the law. It's like, no, that's the one thing that he was telling them, like, no, you're not doing it right. <laughs> like they're, and so that's the change in the law. So it's like, it's not against somebody who's ethnically Jewish, right? It's against the Judaizing 
leaven of ideas that dictates how you're supposed to live that's not according to the heart of the Lord or what he actually desires. Right. Yeah, that's exactly. Yeah. But so that's why Paul says to the one who celebrates the day as unto the Lord, like don't contend with them. And to the one who doesn't celebrate the day as to the Lord, don't contend with them either. The point that we're taking issue with is when somebody comes in and says, this is how you have to do it because that's how the Jews did it and that's what Jesus did. Yeah. And so there's a lot of beauty in those things. I enjoy doing the feast too, like especially Passover. Like I love the, I'm pretty sure Cassie and I met at the Feast of First Fruits. It's like, they're, they're really beautiful. You know, and there's a, there's a huge community reality to being able to remember and learn from these things throughout the year. But it's when you start to come and say like, oh, this is what God wants. When the reality is he was pointing through that to something else so that Paul can say through the law, I died to the law. Yeah. Right. And, and we're, and we're going to see next week. It, it might seem like really heady and theological right now. It's going to just hit the rubber's going to hit the road next week when we talk about the practicalities of what from the feasts do we do. And you're going to go, oh, yeah, I do that as a family. Oh, we do that already. Oh, we do some of this already. You're like, and so um, I don't want to get. The reason why we had this conversation tonight is because is to really draw attention to that it's a living, uh, it's a living testimony. An education in the city built by God is a living testimony. So we're always, as soon as that prayer stops, as soon as we settle on the form and we stop leaning on the Spirit, that's where the danger is, and we will end up building something that God has to tear down later. So that that's like the real. Um, well, and one, one more note to add is just because I think it's how the Spirit communicates. So there was a prominent prof, prophet, I'll, I'll call him a prophet, where he released a word around the time of COVID that it, COVID would be done away with by Passover, right? Obviously, that didn't happen. But I believe the Spirit of the Lord actually told him that because when you understand the heart of Passover, it's only by Passover that anything will be made new and that disease will be done away with, Right? And so it's like that's, that's the stumbling block of the flesh where it's like if you, if, you, if you interpret it according to the flesh, the ordinance of the calendar, you'll actually miss what God's trying to do. And so, that, and so the, I believe the Lord actually spoke to him, but because of the, the understanding of it only applies to this external thing, he actually missed what the Holy Spirit was saying and the message of repentance that was actually being preached to the nation. The Lord actually does that with me all the time. He'll give me, I'll ask him something and he'll say something to me and I'm smart enough now, I'm smart, I'm experienced enough now in his ways that I go, I'm like, what do you mean by that? Because like he'll say something like, he'll give me a name, right? I'm like, oh, that means I'm something, this name. And I'm like, wait a second here. Lord, what do you mean by this name? And then he'll tell me, and the name is parabolic or it's symbolic of something. It's not actually about the name. It's about another reality. But the, the Lord, like, why does he do that? Well, because he loves the relationship. And so the, the forms, the beauty of the forms is that they draw us into mystery. They draw us into questions. He's, we're never gonna stop doing this for billions and billions and billions of years. Well, like, we'll never. Like, and it gets to that bridal reality, right? Because that form of the flesh, that's a veil. And be, because of who's here, we can say that in order to know your wife intimately, you have to enter beyond that veil. And so there's an invitation to a reality that's much deeper and much more intimate than just keeping the day on, or keeping the feast on this day. And so it's through the veil of that flesh that Christ is calling us to enter in. And so if you stop, and so there's two more examples that uh, I'll throw out. One, Charles gave me a word the other day related to all the, a bunch of stuff I'm personally working through in life of like the Lord's called you a governor. And so if I'd stopped there, it was um, like, oh yeah, priest, king, you know, awesome. But what the Lord flipped it for, it was like, no, you're like a car governor. Like your belief, like your belief system is actually not allowing me to progress you faster than what you want, right? And so if I stop at that fleshly interpretation, then I don't enter into the reality. Now, another time he did this to me personally, I asked him, what's your purpose for my life? And he said, military. It's like, okay, so you remember me trying to go to the Marine Corps, all that stuff, after a year and a half, all my waivers still had gone through. I was like, Lord, why is this? And he's like, well, were you going to ask me what I meant by military? I was like, well, no. Like, since he didn't know, I wasn't. But since you brought that up, uh, what did you mean by military? And he's like, well, that you serve me and you love not your own life unto death and you walk under my authority. It's like, well, that doesn't have anything to do with the armed services. But because I was carnal minded, I, and I was still seeking him genuinely, but because I was carnal minded, 
he, I didn't understand what he was saying. And it's the same thing with the law where it says they didn't enter in because of the sin and they have, and so the, to be carnal minded is not necessarily sinful. It just means that you're stuck on the external form, but there's a heart and a substance and a spirit that's contained within that form that actually enables us to enter into the substance of Christ Jesus through the veil of the flesh to where we cut covenant with blood and you enter into the Holy of Holies. And that's where it's like some of these things I don't preach on Saturday night just because there's kids and people have sensitivities, but it's like there's, there's a deep reality. There's a reason Paul says that we're like we're uh, a type pattern of Christ in his church. That's what marriage is. And it's because like within that covenant, it's like there's an actual cutting of, blood, of, of a veil that takes place as a man and a woman become one if you've done everything in its proper order, you know, and even then he can restore it. And it's like, so all, literally all of these realities from Genesis to everything in the law to the way he designed male and female, they all join into one massive reality of what it means to be Christ and his bride. And that's what you miss out on if you stop at this day, this day, this day, this day, right? And so it's beautiful to enter into the meanings of what the days are. And that's why I actually, personally pr prefer to keep the Hebrew calendar. But if somebody's celebrating the birth of Christ, it's like, if he's really outside time, we can celebrate his birth every day of the week. And we can celebrate. And so to somebody who's observing Christmas, it's like, yeah, like don't do the elf on the shelf thing. But if you're genuinely just celebrating <laughs> Jesus, you know, it's like, there's nothing wrong with celebrating Christmas, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Right, and so if that's the stumbling block you have, don't keep, don't do it, <laughs> right? But if you're, if that's not a, and that's where it talks about being sensitive to our conscience. So if somebody says to me, so it's like Paul, like with the meat. So like if you come to see, you come to me one year and you're like, hey, Marshall, you know that, like that that thing that's a pagan holiday. It's got all these roots, and it's like if I'm in community with you, okay, I won't celebrate it, <laughs> you know, because for you, you can't enter into that with a sincere heart, right? But at the same time, to somebody that can enter into that with a pure heart, like I'm not gonna go then browbeat them and use my, and but to that person who still sees it as like a pagan thing and it can only be a pagan thing, I'm not gonna go to them and use the freedom that I have in Christ to make them ashamed of where they're at because they're doing their sincerest to like walk with the Lord and to honor him. And it's like, no, we don't wanna do those things that are honored to idols. It's like, totally agree, amen, I wanna support you in that. But then, so flip, and that's where it's like, that's why Paul says things like to those of us who have knowledge, don't use it as a way to look down at people and don't allow it to puff you up, but we'd be sensitive to the person that doesn't have the knowledge. Yeah. Right. Let me, I'm gonna, okay, I'm gonna, yeah. Um. <laughs> it's like this was, came a lot more than first <laughs> No, it's well it's, it's what's all funny is I've read through the rest of the questions yeah, while do. we were all talking and I feel like we pretty much hit, hit in the discussion yeah. like the spirit of uh, most of them if I'll not see. all of them. See, um, a lot of us moderns miss the church's liturgical mindset when they set the liturgical calendar and it's the kingdom conquers all. And so I know that there's a lot of books out and things that like, well, this holiday has these pagan roots and all these things. And so we shouldn't celebrate it. But when it was actually put on the liturgical calendar, it was like, it was a kingdom conquering thing. Like you're, we're not worshiping that on this day. We're taking this day back and we're gonna make every day holy. And so I've been one that's appreciated the feast days and the liturgical calendar. And I know a lot of uh, guys that do, for, for instance, like on the board of the 10 days of prayer um, that we do every fall from Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur, we've got a Messianic Jewish guy, Grant Berry, and then we have an Anglican priest from Colorado, Father Phil, and they've worked within their spheres to even combine the liturgical calendar. And that's something like us in non-denominational world, we're not familiar with liturgical calendar because that's all that religion stuff we've been set free from, to kind of, so to speak, to kind of tongue in cheek there. But anyway, there, there's just as much of a beauty. And so what I appreciate about the calendar is the same thing I appreciate about the feast. So there's a rhythm to education 
and there's a rhythm into exploring the beauty of God. And both calendars actually um, have some have some strengths and some beautiful things about them. And so I've, I've, I've always been a both and instead of an either or when it comes to those because they, they point at specific things that just help us deep dive further in, into the education piece. But then to be transparent here before you guys, I feel like my role in founding SatHop has been to not build a ministry around me or anyone's gift, but to really be a team. Like I never even saw myself as a ministry leader. I've just always wanted to be a part of a team. And as like the founder of it, I felt like the Lord really mandated me with building foundational things and opening doors for other people to walk through. And so even this topic tonight is actually further than I've been able to be because I've stayed so much on foundational things. And so the beauty of what I'm enjoying tonight, Charles, is I'm just proud of you and I'm proud of you too, Marshall. Just like to be able to plant like small things and open up small doors that you guys are just like blowing open that we can explore together because I feel like for us as a ministry, we're still in just an exploration stage. And so even this discussion is not like a, uh, you know, we are trying to transmit our information to you, but it's like, let's engage back and forth because we're, we're on this journey trying to figure out, we've seen some things where it's like, okay, that's an error over there, that's an error over there. I don't wanna go to like different extremes, um, but I wanna pursue the Lord. And I feel like my piece has been um, from the beginning is to be a people that love the law because that's something that the Lord really hammered me like hard with and not in a convicting way, but just in a loving way, like led me into the beauty of his law, which completely shifted my paradigm on, on scripture. But anyway, all that to say, I feel like we're still in the exploration mode and uh, it, it's just fun. So thank you guys for being a part of the conversation. And then like, man, I'm so proud of you guys because it's like I planted the seed and now I'm here with this giant apple tree just like enjoying the fruit of it. I took a lot of notes and I'm gonna take some more. So thank you. Thank you, Dave. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'll wrap up to, because um, I know we went long, I promise you, we'll try not go as long as time. But I, actually, I, I super... The reason why I staged the questions I did is because this is the conversation we wanted to have. So thank you. Thank you for participating. Thank you for sharing your heart. And know that, um, like Dave said, everything that we're sharing, everything that I'm sharing, I'm not trying to come as, oh, super person has knowledge. Like I said, this is not coming from book knowledge. This is, I mean, other than the Bible, like, but it's not even just reading through the Bible. Like I, it's things that I believe he's showing me that I'm inviting into, into the discussion. And it's through the discussion that we actually grow a lot. And so I'm growing just hearing you guys so much. And so thank you for having sharing. And if there's just anything, um, since I have the mic, I get the final comment before I pray. Um, <laughs> but just anything for on the holidays, on the feasts. Uh, this last Christmas, the Lord specifically asked us, we were one of those people, the Lord asked us to not celebrate. Um, that was through prayer. He confirmed it in radical ways too, like, multiple testimonies, witnesses, Jayla and me, like, we're like, okay, this is super clear. It was really weird to navigate with our family, right? They were actually really upset. Um, and so on, whether it's the liturgical calendar, whether it's the taking the kingdom calendar by, uh, or take, conquering the calendar, right, as the kingdom, like, the thing that I, the Lord keeps bringing me back to is the, the simplest, the simple, exhortation, pray about everything. Um, because there's dangers on either end where, where we can form, oh, this thing's right and this one's wrong. Um, and the question is, is, it's really up to the king. And so I even found for me personally, I'm not gonna put this on anyone else, for me personally, it's presumptuous for me to assume that I can like do this or, or, or commandeer this holiday and make it holy without him as the king commissioning me to do so. But if he does, it's clean and it's pure, right? Because it's the word that I hear and do that purifies. That's just me personally. 
Um, I'm not going to like, for every person's different, we're all navigating that. And I think this is something that the Lord is, is drawing people into. It's not like a, um, it's not like a this or that. It's, he, I think he's just drawing people into this discussion. So, but with that said, I'm going to end. If you guys want to um, ask, have more questions that come up during the week, please send an email, text me. Um, if you don't have my information, I can give it to you. And I look forward to next week. Next week's be very practical. Please read through this. I think you'll be like much more refreshed by this because it's going to be just very um, just practical what we're doing even in the kids' ministry to implement the things that we're going to be talking about next week. Um, no, this is, this is just kind of the homework. Uh, Adam, I'm going to have another printout for session two next week. <laughs> but it's more of a reference. It's a resource because... As we'll discuss, at the back, there's three tutorials, singing the scriptures, doing the scriptures, and praying the scriptures, that when we talk about the seven key components of the feast, they really almost all tie down to word and spirit. And so even with the kids and educating the next generation, all comes down through engaging the word somehow. And so um, I provide three tutorials. I've given it to all the teachers in the kids' ministry to use. Yeah, yeah, this is familiar, right? And so we're going to talk about literal practical examples of how of what we've done with the kids to already implement this, um, what I call the feast education model. So I'm going to end in prayer. Father, I thank you. Thank you for the words tonight. Thank you for the discussion, God. Uh, your word is so rich. You're so rich. And I thank you, Lord, that we're never going to be bored. <laughs> Lord, that is, man, God, that you are beautiful, that you are full of mystery and I thank you that we can even have a conversation where we're going back and forth because you're so deep and yet you're so, um, you're not so deep that you can be also really simple too. Like you're both and all the time. And I just ask that you would blow our hearts wide open with just revelation of your law, revelation of your feasts, revelation of a city built by the Lord, just all these things that we've been talking about, God. I thank you for just speaking to us. Thank you for igniting people's hearts. And I just see, even right now, I just prophesy, I just, I see just specifically where there's been barriers, where you have felt a calling to something in your life, or you have felt like a, a commissioning or just a desire, just see like a real desire for something, but you have not felt like it's worthy. You have not felt like it's worthy because it's not as spiritual as you think. I just liberate you to explore that with God. What does he put in your heart to explore that with him and what that looks like in his city and that it has a place and so, Lord, I just thank you for calling forth and bringing to the surface those um, desires and dreams that have been buried for a long time and uh, just legitimizing them, Father, giving them value, giving them worth. And I thank you that you're going to have a city that is holy, that is glorious, that is born from above, whose gates are wide open and who the wealth of the nations is coming into and that you're going to have a priesthood, Father, that is, um, <laughs> that is beautiful and glorious. And so we just praise you for these things, God. In Jesus' name, amen.